Absolutely. How about we share a couple of updates that we've come across uh, from the community this week? Yeah, screen coming up, or your screen coming up, I mean. Uh, perfect. There we go. So I'm actually going to zoom in on that a little bit. There we go. Um, came across this uh, tweet from Panu from earlier today. Uh, it looks like devices are now reporting Windows 11 24H2 compatibility. Uh, this is at least coming through in Config Manager hardware inventory. Uh, there are a couple of uh, replies to this thread uh, that it's not natively in Intune yet or anything, but... Um, <clears throat> Still worth mentioning, I think, uh, as Panu mentions here, the vast majority of devices that are already on Windows 11, 21H2, 22H2, or 23H2 are going to be compatible. Uh, but useful information nonetheless, just in case there is uh, uh, some compatibility issues. I think uh, in one of the replies, um, Trevor may have mentioned there were, there were a couple of additional safeguards uh, that are popping up for 24H2. So uh, I'll make sure to to post this parent tweet here um, in our links for today. Um, awesome. Because so what of that. was the, it's a little bit hard to see here. Is it, what's the second uh, character after the G? Oh, that GE, all right. So I wonder what that code name is for. I know that NI is for nickel, and the the older ones was cobalt. But or, uh, because they, they're the first two characters in the upgrade experience indicators is the the code name. Well, GE is the uh, um, name for germanium, so maybe that's it. That might be it. All right, we'll find out. Always interesting, but cool to see it showing up. The yes. Catch. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you, Panu, for sharing that. Um, another thing I came across was a fairly large script um, from Martin Himken. Uh, it's a PowerShell script that will help you uh, test network connections uh, to the various Intune services. Um, so you can see here there are a ton of parameters for the script. Uh, like I said, it is a large script. Um, and well documented by the looks of it. Uh, but yet again, a, a, another useful troubleshooting tool in our toolbox. Um, this is something that has come up more frequently, um, especially in some of the, the courses that Johan and I have been teaching, where we're seeing that, um, you know, folks are, uh, whether it's a proxy or whether it's just in enterprising young teenager in the house that is uh, trying to do some DNS ad blocking. Um, <clears throat> you often have some issues where your endpoints can't communicate out to these Intune services. Um, so Martin's script here will help with some of that. Uh, look like he is still continuing to work on this. I know he teased it earlier on this summer um, and I think just released it a couple of weeks ago. So uh, you can see a lot of effort has gone into this. Um, well, that's a decent sized script. Was was one of the collections by any chance the autopilot in in the, in the there's a list of endpoints you could uh, pick? Good question. Looks yeah. looks like it. There we go. Specifies yeah. whether to test all of the autopilot service area. So really fantastic stuff. Nearly 2,000 lines. That is impressive. Commitment right there. Mm. That's right. Um, also came across, uh, I think we mentioned this um, when it was announced over the summer. Let's see, when was this? Beginning of June. Uh, so there's a new look coming for the Intune company portal that's supposed to improve some of the design around the home devices and downloads and updates pages on the company portal. Um, so we mentioned this. There is a way to deploy the preview uh, currently. But the one th the reason I'm bringing it up again today is that the original rollout was August, uh, and I noticed that this is now expected in late September to start rolling out. Uh, so just wanted to call attention to that real quick. All right. Uh, and the last thing I had here was what looks to be somewhat of a nasty uh, uh, bug that is patched in this uh, 
in this week's patch Tuesday, um, there is a TCP IP remote code execution bug uh, that's patched um, that affects all systems that have IPv6 enabled. Uh, these days, I haven't really been seeing too many devices disable uh, IPv6. I don't know. Are you still running into that much these days, Johan? It still happens. Some organizations yeah, okay. have it disabled, but in general, um, they, they leave it on because there are other features in Windows that may rely upon it or use it. Uh, often features you don't even think will be using um, IPv6 is, is using it. Mm -hmm. And I think Microsoft has long said, you know, their recommendation is to leave it enabled, but there absolutely yeah. are reasons that, that you may not. So if you do have this enabled in your environment, um, patch, it looks like start patching. And this is all the way back to, um, let me see if I had that right. I think this may have been Vista, 2008. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I have to upgrade those Vista machines, Andrew. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm back. So I gotta go. I, I gotta go patch all these things now. Um, but hey, you and I both know they're they're probably out there in some 2008 servers as well. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Good lord. Yep. So start patching, uh, basically. <laughs> Yep. All right. So that was what I had for today. All right. I had a, a few things. Um, first of all, uh, I stumbled across a interesting tweet. Go ahead and share that screen. Uh, Mike Marble noticed that um, during out-of-box experience, if you deploy an older image because you want to test something with that particular image, it started to patch right away and upgrade to uh, the next version of Windows. And they can be pretty time-consuming, those feature updates, if you're sitting there waiting for something to happen. So my immediate comment at this post, okay, that is cool. That's helpful to make sure you get up on the latest version, but how do you disable it? I uh, haven't figured out that one yet, yet but maybe. Uh, some info will shine up or come up here in the in the discussion. So it was a long thread going on after this one, but I thought it was interesting enough to to mention. And then I stumbled across an old update that I must simply have missed at some point. But it turned out that if you set this particular registry key when you deploy machines to be patched by the either config command or into and in this case, uh, as, as the tweet was about, um, this was a school, they were deploying a bunch of spare machines and just had them sit there available, but they would never patch until someone would actually log on to the device. So this key allowed them to, to hopefully do that. So looking forward to play around and test for this one. Uh, I saw some other community members chime in and say, yeah, we have a script that sets this. Beautiful. All right. So, yeah, maybe that. Um, then I revisited an old friend today, uh, Boogie yes, in, in Conflict Manager. Uh, uh, me and, and some folks at work, uh, Mike Terrell and others, we were, were uh, updating Boogie Images or copying Boogie Images. And we needed a quick way to figure out, okay, what drivers has been added to them? Because you guys probably know that if you uh, go into a boot image in Config Manager, like this one here, uh, of course, you can easily see uh, what drivers have been added to it. And if I wanted to add those same drivers to another boot image, well, in this case, I had four. So it wouldn't have been that big of a trouble of going and, and edit them for others. Uh, but uh, turn out that there are ready-made uh, options in the uh, get and boot image PowerShell commandlet to figure out all the reference drivers for it. So if I run this little snippet here, kaboom, and then select my boot image drivers, then I have information about all those drivers and I can easily script that into all the other ones. So that would be one way of doing it. Of course, I can also find the drivers in config manual, right click and do edit, and I can add that to multiple boot images. And that's probably fun, the first 40 drivers. And then, <laughs> so I thought it was cool. 
And I've stumbled across this one again. I, I, I also saw some scripts out there in the community. People have been writing to basically allow you to duplicate a boot image. Like I have one here. I just want to copy with all the settings. So that was pretty cool. So total sidebar, but I, I thought it was brilliant. No, that's fantastic. I actually happen to have another uh, way that I think I can use that. I'm helping somebody move from uh, basically legacy driver packages over to modern driver management. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that I've always learned was uh, you still, of course, have to have your storage and network drivers that are attached to boot images um, that loaded helpful, into yeah. your yeah yeah and loaded into your your legacy driver packages, right? A fantastic way to very easily list out what you would need mm -hmm. um, in that scenario as well. So thank you for that. You just solved um, you just solved a, a problem for me. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, or I'll send you the bill. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> So, no, that was uh, what I heard in, in terms of updates at the moment. It's always fun to stumble across older stuff. That is that's a good refresher, if anything. Definitely. 